Uh, now joining us, Joe Dinkin. He's uh, with the Working Families Party. Uh, they're uh, very progressive and and uh, very strong. They've been supporting uh, a lot of great candidates that have uh, gotten victories uh, across the country. So, Joe, welcome uh, to the Young Turks. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the air tonight, Jen. Uh, no problem. So tonight, uh, who are you guys supporting in these races? Yeah, there's a lot of exciting races that we're watching um, from Pennsylvania to Oregon to Nebraska tonight. Um, I'm, you know, watching uh, with bated breath the same Pennsylvania seven numbers coming in that you are. Um, you know, Craig Edwards is somebody who is a, a real progressive champion um, running on Medicare for all. I think he's he's somebody who um, uh, I, you, you guys may have seen reported the DCCC actually called him to try to push him out of the race. Was it because he was too progressive? Was it because he was the only African American in a majority white district? You know, I, I couldn't tell you, but he is, to my mind, the, the kind of candidate that we need in Congress. Um, and, you know, what's exciting to me is what we've seen all over the country this summer is um, this spring and into the summer is progressive people, kind of ordinary people who in a normal time may have never run for office before, stepping up to do something extraordinary, kind of learning new skills, and uh, people who don't come out of the political establishment at all, but come out of community organizations, out of social movements, out of unions, um, who come from uh, these progressive groups uh, and are running on full-throated progressive values. And uh, up and down the ballot, a lot of them are winning. You know, I don't think we're gonna win every race that we're, we're working on tonight. Um, but but there's a lot of really good ones um, at the congressional level and also further down the ballot. Um, should I talk some more about some of the Pennsylvania races or? Uh, hold on, Joe, before you do that, I do want you to do that. Um, just curious, how do you guys uh, pick a candidate? Uh, what's your criteria for supporting one? Because there's a million candidates across the country, uh, so it's always interesting to find out how you guys make that decision. Yeah, there's a huge number of races that it's possible to get involved in. So what we do is, um, for us, our candidate endorsement process starts with a questionnaire. Um, it's a questionnaire that asks candidates to lay out their vision and why they're running, but it also asks them really specific questions on everything from a $15 min minimum wage to Medicare for all, to their vision of comprehensive immigration reform, to transforming our uh, deeply broken criminal justice system, to getting the kind of big money out of politics that um, is underpinning so many of the crises that our political system is, is unable to, to, uh, to change. So we start with that questionnaire, um, then we um, talk to um, activists on the ground, to grassroots leaders, to organizers who we, who we know, and then depending on the geography, the process can go a little bit different. Um, it often includes um, it often includes an interview with members or leaders of the local WFP chapter, um, and then that's and then votes come come after that. So one more thing about that, Joe, um, because someone can have the right issues. In the old days, it would have been uh, hard to find someone with the right issues because uh, the Working Families Party has always been very progressive, and now a lot of people are in that camp, but in the, in the past uh, you had less to choose from, especially people willing to run. Um, but but now you do. You have plenty of people to choose from, so a lot of people might answer the questions in a very similar way. So how do you look at viability? Uh, what factors do you look at to see if someone has a real great chance of winning in that race? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of factors that go into it. But, but one of the biggest ones is how well networked they are in their community, how long they've been doing the work. You know, we'll sometimes run into people who say, um, you know, I want to run for Congress because I support all the issues you do. And, you know, we'll, we'll look at their organizing plan. We'll look at how many people they know. We'll look at their, their profile in the community and we'll say, you seem, like, you seem like a great person, but, you know, we think you might do better to start at the local level. You may want to think about running for city council or state representative. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a big undertaking to run for Congress, you know, even uh, in, in among for a progressive candidate, um, you know, you hear about all of these candidates who are able to generate lots of small dollar donors and some progressive candidates can can strike lightning that way. But it's it's uh, it's a hard thing to run for Congress. You have to raise hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Um, and, you know, that's that's you have to raise a pretty good chunk of that just to even get anybody to notice you. Uh, I hate to say what a big role money is in politics. Um, but but there are a lot of people who could do a lot of good running for legislative seats as well. Um, and so we often try to work with candidates, especially when we find them early, to help coach them into what the right office is 
where um, their sort of skill and experience level and level of, of network in their community and willingness to do the work and, and learn how to do the work um, is, is a best fit. So sometimes that might be a state legislative race or a city council seat. Sometimes it might be running for Congress. Yeah, and, and I want the audience to understand why that makes sense because yeah, it's not just good enough to be right on the issues. We need to win so we actually bring change. Because if That's you don't right. bring that change, then what are we doing this for, right? In order to bring that change, you got to win. And it, we're not, we're never going to, whether it's Working Families Party, Young Turks, Just Democrats, PCCC, you're, we're never going to decide based on corporate donor money, of course not, right? But if you have a, a good network in the community, that tells you a couple of things. One, you might be able to raise small dollar donations. Two, you might have more voters. And three, you might have more volunteers. And four, people trust you because you put in the work earlier to build that community. So I think that makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's absolutely right. That's how we look at it too. Yeah. So Joe, now let's go back to Pennsylvania. Who else you guys uh, have running there? So there are, um, you know, one race that I'll, I'll call a win for early before the polls are closed is, is Jess King out in Lancaster. Um, she is a progressive candidate whose primary challenger actually fled the district after redistricting. Um, so she goes on uh, goes on to the general election tonight without uh, much muss or fuss, but she's really a candidate to watch um, and the kind of uh, energizing movement progressive who's building an incredible grassroots organization that is the only way um, she's gonna, you know, any candidate would be able to, to flip a Republican leaning district like, like hers out in the Pennsylvania 11th. Um, there's also Rich Laser, um, who is a uh, progressive. He was the sort of go-to guy for unions and the labor movement inside the uh, administration of Jim Kenney the mayor of Philadelphia. He was recently endorsed by Bernie Sanders and um, has been campaigning on a $15 minimum wage and a federal jobs guarantee and free college. And it looks like he's winning tonight, uh, walking away. Um, and then there are also three Philly uh, legislative races that we're watching really closely. Um, in each of those cases, the last time I saw the numbers, we were uh, ahead by a hair in each. Um, and I'll just tell you about all three of them really quickly. Um, Chris Rabb is uh, in the Mount Airy section of Philly. He's a, a progressive who won an insurgent primary in 2016 against the Philly Democratic machine. Um, and wouldn't you know it, in 2018, that same Democratic machine is coming for him again. Um, so we're defending him in a, in a primary right now. He's one of the leading uh, progressive voices in the Philly State House. Um, another is Joe Hohenstein in the northeast end of Philly. Um, uh, he's a nationally renowned, uh, nationally notable immigration attorney. Um, we supported him running in a Republican-leaning district in 2016. Ultimately turned out that, that 2016 wasn't such a good year in a lot of Republican-leaning districts, but he's running again this year in a competitive primary, and we're hoping to uh, put him back into the general election again this year and then, and then help him um, pick up that Republican-leaning district in, in Northeast Philly. I think it's the last Republican seat in all of Philadelphia. And then the last one that I'm really excited about is a first-time candidate, uh, Liz Fiedler, um, who was a, has been an investigative reporter um, writing about the unequal funding in Philadelphia public schools. Um, and she's running as an insurgent progressive um, in an open seat, um, fighting to fully fund public education, raise the minimum wage. She's uh, backed by lots of progressive groups, uh, including the uh, Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and I think her win is going to be a real shock to the system um, in, in Philadelphia if she manages to pull it out. Uh, Chris Rabb an old friend of mine. Uh, uh, is that right? Yeah, he. We kind of grew up in the progressive movement together. Uh, so, um, well, I'll uh, I'll tell him you say hi. Oh, absolutely. Uh, tell him that, and then we'll be following that race closely. And uh, and I and I love the the fact that he won last time. Uh, and I I hate the fact that they're coming for him again. Uh, what happened? I thought they didn't want to waste money on uh, uh, primaries. You know, it's a funny thing. That road seems to only go one way. <laughs> yeah, and I thought incumbents were everything. Well, Chris is an incumbent now, so what happened? He's an incumbent, and yet somehow they're not treating him like a part of the club. Oh, funny how that works. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, one more thing, Joe. How does the Working Families Party interact with the Democratic Party? Because uh, all these candidates are uh, under the Democratic label. That's right. You know, the, the Democratic Party, that's a, it's a pretty big thing. Um, our best allies are the progressives in the Democratic Party. They tend to uh, to love to work with us. They tend to be really excited that there's somebody fighting for the same things that they are that's willing to get in and do the work, mobilize volunteers, um, help train their 
train their uh, volunteers, help recruit staff, help raise small dollar donors for them. Um, they tend to be really happy with us. Uh, the people who think we're their enemy are the uh, conservative end, the business end of the Democratic Party. And, you know, I think their stranglehold on things is, is starting to evaporate. I think there was a, uh, a long running view in the establishment wing of the Democratic Party that there was only one way to win in, uh, in swing districts. And that was by being a moderate uh, self-funding white guy, or at least a moderate white guy, sometimes a moderate white woman, um, who didn't want to say anything that would alienate a Republican and therefore uh, couldn't say anything that would energize their base. Uh, the idea that that's the best way to win, I think that's um, showing itself every every day uh, more and more to be a lie as we're seeing these uh, full-throated progressives from a whole set of diverse backgrounds being able to run really compelling campaigns without big money backing and, and being able to win. Yeah, look, I don't know if the audience appreciates enough uh, how we're in the middle of history right now. The progressive movement is rising and 2018 is just the first test and it's the tip of the spear in a lot of ways. And so the establishment's trying to fight back against it and hold it at bay. Uh, and sometimes they do when an incumbent like Lipinski wins uh, and, and a lot of times they don't. Uh, when the Just Democrats won in Texas, and then we'll obviously see, and, and in Pennsylvania, all these races are so close. Yep. And and Michael sure was on the show uh, a little bit earlier. He's been a polit political correspondent at TYT for the whole 16 years we've been on, and he has an excellent beat on uh, on politics. And he made a great point, which is, look, any wins in 2018 is amazing, because 2020 is where you're going to get your real victories. And and so, if you were, you were to push Greg Edwards in, that would be fantastic. It would make it would make a huge difference, and it would also energize people. So, and and the difference now between progressives and, and the establishment is gigantic, because I had a friend who wanted to run for Congress. He went and talked to uh, the top Democrats in the state, uh, and they only had one question for him: How much money can you raise? They never. Ask them a single question about the issues. You guys do a questionnaire of issues. Uh, Just Democrats Sorry. has it's a very long. progressive platform. How many issues that we want to hear about? Yeah, that's for progressive organizations. That's the first question, right? right? Are you an actual progressive? For the Democratic Party, they don't even ask. So that's it's amazing. It's all the difference in the world, and that's the fight that we're in the middle of tonight. Tonight. That's why I think yeah. it's it's historic, and I think that. Edwards race is almost a linchpin in that in that swing of history and right now you know he goes he's in first second third third second first and so it, it's a hell of a night so what one last thing related to the question I was asking you about that interplay though so you're sporting and endorsing a lot of the democratic candidates within their primaries are there places for the people at home who, who've not heard of the working families party or haven't heard much about it um, where it is a third party and, and you guys would run against the Democrat? Yeah, it's happened a handful of times, um, generally in very blue areas where when there's a Democrat who we think doesn't meet our values and we think that there's an opportunity to win, we'll run a working families party only member against them in a general election and be able to win. And it, you know, it's happened a handful of times. Uh, I think three state legislators in New York and Connecticut, a handful of local elected officials in places like Hartford and Bridgeport, um, Brooklyn, yeah. Albany, a couple more. Um, but most of the time, what we end up doing is supporting progressives running inside Democratic primaries. And you know, for us, we really see the Democratic Party as a field of contest. Um, we want the Democrats to win uh, because, you know, America under Trump is just too scary. But we also want progressive Democrats to be dominant inside, you know, inside the Democratic Party, inside Democratic caucuses, inside city councils, inside state legislative bodies. Um, so we we fight hard to strengthen the strengthen the progressives. Once in a while, um, you know, we'll we'll end up running against the Democrat at the local level where we believe we can really beat them. And generally, when we do that, we win. Uh, but we don't do it so often. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of people frustrated with the Democratic Party, very very understandably so. So they might be thinking at home, well, why not do it more often? So you're more entrenched in New York, where you, it's easier to get on the ballot. But is it is it tough to get on the ballot in in some of the other states? Well, uh, you know the the ballot access law. It's really about 
this is going to be boring for people. It's really about uh, cross endorsement or fusion voting, which is the system that we have in a handful of states, uh, New York, Connecticut, Oregon, South Carolina, a couple of more where a candidate can be listed on the ballot as the Democratic candidate and the working families candidate. Most states actually don't permit that. So instead of existing directly on the ballot uh, and instead of sort of running into the same um, spoiler problem that other minor party efforts throughout the last uh, 100 years in America have run into, um, we end up doing something different, which is that we uh, treat the Democratic Party itself like a, like a field of contest. Um, and we recruit and train our own people to run for office. And then those people, you know, often the, the best path to be able to win is to run inside the Democratic Party primary. Uh, because the Democratic Party is the Democratic primary is the usually the most progressive slice of the electorate, and that gives you ballot access for the the general election um, and a, a party label that uh, at least you know at least forty percent of the voters can uh, can live with in most of the country. So it provides a, an on ramp for um, progressive candidates to be able to run inside Democratic Party primaries with outside institutions and infrastructure and support. Yeah. And but it is a real issue, and I, that's why I want people at home to understand that. Uh, that if, uh, uh, except for a couple of states, just gaining access to the ballot, just being able to to put that infrastructure together is exceedingly difficult. I think it's much easier to do what you guys are doing, which is board the ship and and take it over. There's already a ship there, uh, and there's no reason why progressives shouldn't dominate the Democratic Party. That was. The original point of the Democratic Party. That's right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Joe Dinkin from the Working Families Party. And by the way, Joe, one last thing. Uh, where can people go to find out more uh, both about you guys and, and your candidates? Yeah, people should go to www.workingfamilies.org. You can sign up to get involved in our campaigns. You can donate. Um, and one of the links on the front page is a list to all of our uh, endorsements we've made across the country so far. I think there's a couple hundred already this year. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for joining okay, us. Thanks for your time.